That's right, isn't it, Sarah? You're a teacher. You don't just, you don't just make it up. You, you've got some stuff. And, and the stuff that you're given is, you know, is based on a curriculum. A curriculum which is like lays out everything the children need to know to pass a test. This is what we need to learn it. They need to know it. This is what we want to, where we want to get them by the end of the year, for example. That's, that, that's a curriculum. That curriculum, Sarah? Um, great, two, good, yes. Two curriculum. A catechism is, is quite like that. There are some people that they've been written, various ones have been written, but they are written because they, there, are, there are people in churches and across, across a country who need to know the true things about God, how they, what, what their problem is, their guilt, this is what Heidegger has is, their guilt, how they can be saved, God's grace, how they can live in gratitude, the three Gs of the Heidelberg Catechism. And so they put together this curriculum, this catechism to be taught to children and to adults, to teach them how all the things about God fit together. Teaches what we're really like, teaches how we can be rescued by God, teaches how to live in really digestible form of questions and answers. So it's like a curriculum for people who follow Jesus, this. And so that's what we're doing, and we're, we've been doing it for five weeks, and um, we've gone through one big section already, and we've come to the end of it, of the Heidelberg Catechism, which is, like I said, based on three things, which is guilt. First, first four, four days are about guilt. The next plenty of days are about God's grace. And the, and the last ones are about our, how to live in gratitude. So we've covered guilt, and we're now moving to grace. And just in case you uh, haven't been here or have forgotten, haven't been just running through the Heidelberg Catechism all week and every day, you might have, so you might have forgotten a few things from the, the other week. Let me very quickly sum up the, the guilt, the situation we're in as the Heidelberg the, the Heidelberg, as the Heidelberg I'm just going to call it the, the H catechism because the Heidelberg's really hard to say. The H catechism tells us, um, tells about, okay? So guilt, we start with, it says that the law, God's law is given and God's law is perfect but it, and it condemns us. It shows us what we're like and we can't keep it. That means we're guilty before God. God made us able, able to not sin. God made people able to not sin but, but now... Since the very first sin, we have a corrupt, broken nature, and we cannot do good. We cannot keep the law of God, his standard, which means we're guilty. And God is merciful, but he must judge. He must judge because he is also a fair God, and he must judge, and that is fair. And so it leaves us, at the end of the last week, in a position where we deserve to be judged for our sin and our guilt. And that's pretty heavy. And it was quite heavy. But it's necessary to to tell us what we're actually like and the problems we have. We're now going to move to to, to grace. But I think it's a bit like this. Did any any of you grow up, when you grew up, did any of you have a hobby, like any hobby, like any trains, hobby trains, what are they called? Hornby train sets. Anyone have a Hornby train set when they grow up? I can see a little nod from Phil. We've got a nod here. They're little trains and they run on little tiny tracks and they go around. I used to love them when I went to my friend's house and they just had this amazing set with like little tiny trees. No idea where he got them from, these little trees. Um, maybe from the little tree store. And they, they had this big, big kind of table of trains and they would go around and it was really therapeutic and beautiful. I wanted to get, it's persuade Florence to like trains the other day about a year ago, because I really wanted to pretend that she liked them so I could get a train set, because I really wanted one in my house. But the point is, of all of that, is that trains, trains on train sets, and trains in general, if they want to switch from one track to another, they need to have a, a, they need to have a junction where they, you know, there's a little click, and the train, the train track kind of clicks from left to right, or right to left. And they switch from tracks. But the one thing about switching tracks is you have to do it right. Um, and you have to do it carefully. Um, both tracks have to switch, for example. You can't, if, if one, only one of the tracks switch and they're slightly off, it's a disaster for the model trains and for big trains. We are switching tracks here from guilt to grace. And the reason I use that illustration is because just like it's very easy to, it is quite easy to get it wrong, where particularly with toy train sets, where you can, the, the, the train track can kind of switch half and the train will just run along and, 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 and the train will just fall over. It, it's really easy in our heads and in our hearts when we, 
when we move from knowing that we're guilty before God and we're switching to think about how, how is there any way out? How can we be rescued? It's really easy to not do the switch carefully enough. Because if we don't do that switch carefully enough, we can get God wrong. And we can, we can actually misunderstand how God is able to forgive us and bring us the life that we need from him. So we're going to be switching tracks as we go from guilt to grace, but we've got to do it carefully. And that is basically what this week is, this, this week is all about. It's, got, it's basically four questions which set up the problem and then start to think about the solution, but they don't just go, right, there's a problem, here's a solution straight away. They, they take steps to go, what, what does this, can the solution not be? What can it not be? What can it not be? Oh, this, it must be this. And so we're going to be switching tracks carefully this evening. And next week, we're going to go full on into, into how God brings us grace, if that makes some sense. And that's where we're going. We should have some questions that are going to up on the screen. Oh, on the screen too. Um, we're going to look at question 12. Levante, can, Jimpy, can that, we make that happen? There we go, great. So thank you. The question 12. This is the first one we're going to look at. And you'll notice it's still very much in guilt territory. Verse 12 says this, Since then, by the righteous judgment of God, we deserve temporal and eternal punishment. Punishment, guilt, you see the connection. Is there no way by which we may escape that punishment and again be received into his favor? We just have to spend a little bit of time on that question because it helps us to understand why it's so, again, why it's so important to move slowly. Did you see the language? Since then, by the righteous judgment of God, God who is completely righteous and he judges people completely fairly, we deserve, all human race, deserve temporal and eternal punishment. That's eternal punishment he's talking about. That is a big thing. Eternal means forever. We talked about judgment last week, and we, we looked at how fair it was. But, but in this culture, and probably forever, it's very hard, isn't it, to, to talk about eternal punishment without people's ears pricking up, without us stopping and going, whoa, hold on, what, are you talking about hell? I had a, a boss who, um, who was my boss when I worked um, a few years ago, and... Um, we were driving in a car to pick up some, something for our, one of the lessons we were preparing. And she, um, I, t- I, she, I, I was thinking about going to work for, for a church. So she was talking to me about it. And she said, oh, there's a church near us, isn't there? Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's all right. But it's one of those churches. You know, one of those churches, it's all fire and brimstone. I, uh, I, really, I went once, but I didn't want to go back because it's all fire and brimstone. And, and I have no idea what that church was like. But there's this tagline you can throw onto churches, isn't there? That, oh, they're, those hellfire churches that they preach hell, they're not the right sort of churches. We don't want those. And there's this stereotype of them, which is like, you know, they, all they do is they blaze from the front and you're trying to be judged. There's this really negative connotations we have with eternal punishment. Uh, let me just tell you, please, I, I don't have any desire particularly to talk about eternal punishment. I don't like it, I don't enjoy it, I don't get off on it. But just like you want a doctor to tell you really what's wrong with you and what's going to happen if you don't do something about it, that is why I will want to will talk about it now, if that's okay. Um, eternal punishment is w- what Jesus talks about. He mentions it time and time again. He uses horrible phrases like where the worm will not die and the fire will not be quenched when he's warning people of what will happen if they don't repent and turn to him. So I'm going to take that even though this was written a long time ago, it's true. The Bible still speaks today and this is what we face. Um, we might say often, oh, we, yeah, yeah, we, we do want judgment, don't we? But we, want it, we, don't, we definitely want it for people like Hitler and Pol Pot. But the Bible says if you have it for them, you have to have it for everybody who turns away from God. So It has to be for us too. And if you're wondering about whether that's fair, let's let's spend a little bit of time on that. Um, We talked about, we've talked about in the Catechism how we've all turned away from God, we've all sinned. Um, But to understand why eternal punishment is fair for our sins, 
let me ask you a question. Like, well, let's go through a scenario. If I put, if I turn to you and I put two fingers up and I maybe shoved you and swore in your face, not much, it, you'd be a bit cross, wouldn't you? You'd be probably very cross. But in terms of the law, you couldn't really go to a policeman and, and get me arrested for doing that, could you? If I did it to a policeman, I would be put in jail for a little bit of time. Maybe, maybe. If the policeman wasn't, you know, was, it was in the wrong time and the policeman wasn't busy and there weren't loads of other people doing it, I would I'd maybe get put in jail for a week or a few nights or have a fine or something like that. If I did it to the Queen, what would happen? It would be more, much more serious, wouldn't it, to do it to the head of a state, head of our state, well, she, wherever she, however she is politically. You get the point. The more important the person, legally, the, and the, the same offence, but it's more serious. It, it ramps up every time, the punishment. And if we were then to compare the Queen to the living God, who is the creator of, you know, everything that's in this room, he's holding together right now. And he's made, and, and you know, he's holding together, like, millions of rooms like this he's he's that powerful he's that awesome he created this whole world out of nothing he um he knows every one of us inside out he um he has always existed and will always exist he his knowledge is infinite his his his, his how good and pure is that's infinite too everything about his, him is infinite he could not be better and we don't just swear at him and punch him in the face. We constantly live like he's a nothing. That's what sin is. You know, it's, it's living like he is nobody and you want to live your own life. And you see the extent of the offense there to the infinite God, the eternal God. It deserves the biggest punishment. And the eternal God, offending him in that sort of way, do you see the logic? It deserves eternal punishment. And punishment like that only really makes sense if God is that great and that big. And that's, I think, why some people today reject it a bit, because they don't really get how great God is, as it's revealed in the Bible, how wonderful he is, how glorious he is. And so they think, hell, that's an awful thing to think about, isn't it? But, but not if the offense is that bad? You think about some of the offenses we hate the most and we think there's no judgment that could, be, that could be sufficient for that person to pay. Sometimes it's always worse when it's offending God. And so that's why that's there. But you know, um, um, if we were to think about the next bit of the question, you, do you know... Um, I don't know what your favorite action film is, but one of my favorite action films is, um, is well, it's a group of films, the Indiana Jones films. And they're particularly useful to talk about now because always in those films, there's a point where it looks like Indiana Jones is about to, um, is about to die in a dramatic fashion. It might be that there's a boulder behind him and he's running down the hill. It might be that there is, there's one of the, the classic double wall that's coming in. And he's not sure whether he's going to get out of the classic double wall. And how is he going to, how is he going to get out of this? But there, there's always a moment where you, in those, those encounters where you see his eyes and he's looking around and he's looking, he's, he's desperately searching for a way out of the desperately horrible situation he's in. And that's, that's pretty much exactly what the second bit of this question is. Is there no way? We've seen how great the punishment is. Is there no way we, we may escape the punishment? and be again received into favor with God. You see how we're moving from guilt to grace? We've, we've seen how, how bad the punishment is, but we're asking the question, we're looking around, the, the boulder's coming on us, and we're looking, where is, is there any way out? You're desperate. And then we get the answer. It's like, it's like one of those answers that your, your mum gives or someone gives you, yeah, but, yeah, but. God will have his justice satisfied. And therefore, we, we must make this full satisfaction by either ourselves or by another. Satisfied is a funny word in this context, so don't use it much. 
Um, I think it's useful to talk about food to kind of get the sense of what satisfaction means. Is when you have a film, uh, when, you, when you're a little bit hungry, there are certain foods, right, that, that satisfy you. And there are certain foods aren't. I guess a, an example that doesn't really satisfy you or maybe pretends to would be a classic McDonald's. Compare, if you compare that to a Christmas dinner, you get the sense of which is going to satisfy your hunger more. It's the big meaty mm, Christmas dinner. If you're a meat eater, if you're a vegetarian, it's the it's the nut mm, thing <laughs> or something like that. You, you get what I'm saying? The, the big mm, meal that satisfies you and says, "Oh, I don't need any more. I don't I don't want any more. There's no need for any more." Whereas with a McDonald's, it's like you know, half an hour later, I need more. You're content and you're happy when you've had a big Christmas dinner. God's perfect justice, his, this sense of having to put wrong right is perfect, it's infinite, it couldn't be better. And um, we're looking for a way out from this judgment. But there's no way, because God is perfect, that he will let that happen, no way, unless this need to offset, the, to, to punish and to, to do justice to the wrong that's been done will be, is satisfied till it's been filled, till, till it is no more needed. Because otherwise, he wouldn't be a just God if he just let it go, let it disappear. He wouldn't be righteous. He wouldn't be holy. He wouldn't be pure. He wouldn't be God. We get some of that, I think, when we see a criminal get away, don't we? When we see a criminal get out, get out of, um, you know, get away or, or be not punished or has got off at trial, there's all those legal dramas about someone who you know has done a crime but committed a crime but hasn't been punished for it. We get the injustice. So does God. And he has to have it satisfied. And so it has to be paid. There is no way around that in this universe. You cannot just whisper away, whatever you do, you know, whisk away sin, like sweep it under the carpet, pretend it's not there. God doesn't just go, oh, it's no problem. Don't you worry. It's fine. You've just offended me eternally. Don't worry. It's fine. No problem at all. Forget about it. The thing is, lots of people say that, don't they? And this is a way you can move tracks r wrong. If you just say, oh, it doesn't matter. If you think God says to you when you sin, oh, it doesn't matter. You think it's all right. Don't worry. You just become flippant about wrong then, if that's what you do. You think it's not that serious. You think kind of wrong is just almost the same as right. You know, why does it matter if, if God's just going to forgive me? Sin's all like nothing. It's not. He has to pay it. It's, it's, it's bad. It's wicked. It's evil. And, and he's going to pay it. God never thinks like that about sin. He's not flippant towards it. He's serious about it. So as his people, we should be serious about sin. When you see wrong, when you commit it in your heart, when you lust, when you, you want to hurt people, when you're angry with people, it's all sin. It does matter. It does matter. Really matters. It must be paid. And knowing that is how you move the tracks carefully. And, and at the very end of question 12, which is definitely the biggest question we're going to look at, you see that little bit at the end, either by ourselves, oh no, or, or another. And there's that little glimmer of hope. Another, another, another could pay it. Who might that be? What might that be? How might that happen? Well, let's find out. Next question. Please. Brilliant. Next question. Now, I'd love you to imagine something. I don't know if you like shopping or you don't like shopping, but I want to imagine you're in the Trafford Center. I want you to imagine you're in the Trafford Center, which is your, the place you sh uh, maybe love, maybe hate, but it doesn't matter because you have been in the Trafford Center and you have been trashing it. You've been smashing it apart. You've been nicking stuff. You've been spoiling the floors. You've been getting a hammer to all these displays. You've been destroying everything you possibly can in a trap. And you've been loving it. You've been like, this is great. How good is this? We're just like doing what we want. We can get away with anything. We're eating all the food that's not ours. You're completely smashing it up. And there's loads of you. And then all of a sudden, the owner of the trap, whoever that is, walks in. And, you, and with loads of police, and you are caught. You are caught. 
and they just want they just want right to be done. They are they are appalled by what you've done, and they are they just want justice. They are after justice, and and so you go through that same procedure that Indiana Jones goes through almost, or we we do under the eternal judgment of God, and you go, oh, but oh no, I've I've caught red-handed. What what do I do? Is there anyone or anybody, is there any way out of this? And you start to look for ways that this justice can be paid. Is there any way out of it? And that is the same, that's exactly where we are. Can anyone else make this satisfaction? Can, is there any human, if you, if you like, if you're in a traffic and you're lining up and there are, there are a few people around, you're thinking, who might, be, who might be able to pay this thing? Who could do it? Maybe another person could do it, you wonder. Maybe another person can do it. Maybe there's somebody who'd be willing to die for me. Maybe I'd be willing to die for my children or something like that. Maybe there's other people. You know, that could happen. Maybe someone will go and die for me. You know, they might think, actually, I'm going to make a deal with God, and I'm going to go and run and sacrifice myself so my family can live. I think some religions may do that. Sacrifice. There's one brave person who says they'll do it. But there's a problem. That can't happen. Job 9, verse 2, 3 says this, behold, God puts no trust in his holy ones, his people, in the, and the heavens are not pure in his sight. How much less one who is abominable and corrupt, a man who drinks injustice like water. The problem with me making a deal with God and saying I'll die for somebody else or somebody saying, oh, I'll do it, is that that person is, has already sinned. It's like in the Trafford Center, if you're, all, you're all in trouble. <laughs> And um, one of you just says, oh, I'll die for all of them. And, and the owner says, no, you've committed the crime as well. You, you, you need to pay, but, but so, do everyone, so does everyone else. You've got to pay yourself. And if you've got to pay yourself, you, you're, you're dying only really pays for yourself. And if you want to add to that, that, that second line, As we, the more we live, and say maybe you think, well, I won't die, I'll, I'll try and work my way so I'm so good that I'll be able to pay it back. But the Bible says, no, we, we'll just increase our debt if we do that. So that's a bit like someone in the traffic center saying, I will, um, I will start cleaning the floor that I've made a mess of. But at the same time as cleaning the floor, they're, they're coloring it in behind them because they don't know any other way, and they're just doing it. It's, it's like that with God. We, we say, oh, I'll be really good. I'll be really good, I promise. But at the same time, we're, we're sinning all the time in our hearts. We're doing all this stuff which God doesn't like. And so blanket rule, there's no way we can pay it back for ourselves or for another person. Just can't. There's no way. Maybe someone else has a bright idea, though. Maybe they go, whoa, what about... We can go to the next slide now, I think. What about... What about, what about, what about somebody who is, ah, something else? Can there be found anywhere one who is a mere creature able to satisfy for us? Hmm, maybe someone else. Maybe this mere creature could be an angel of some form. Could, we, could an angel come down and sort it out? To which I think the answer is no. <laughs> Blanket no again. And the reason is, is that God is a fair God. So if God is a, a fair God, and we're all connected, you know, all the people in the traffic center have, have, done, the, have done the sin, then something else, which isn't a, a human, can't, can't come in to say, I'll take it for them. He says, no, humans are lumped in together. And only, only a human can pay for a human. Ezekiel 18.4 gives a little cute clue to this. Let me just find it for you and I'll read it out. That's when you realize you've not looked up Ezekiel for a little while in your Bible. Ezekiel 18.4. Where are you, fella? Where are you? Behold, God says, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son, is mine. And the soul who sins 
shall die. It has to be the same stuff if it's going if it, if to pay the punishment. God won't punish a, a horse for a, a dog's mistakes. It won't punish a dog if the, if the pig has been eating the, eating the food instead. And it, it won't punish any other creature that's been made like a supernatural creature, like an angel, for us. He won't do it. He won't do it. He's fair. But he also... Imagine the next scenario might be more about a, a human who is perfect. That would be a lot of people's best bet. What if there's a human who's perfect? And in our Christianity, we say this stuff a lot, don't we? We talk about this, and you could easily get the, get the, the idea that a perfect human is all you need to die for, for us. You know, we even say that about Jesus. Jesus, who is perfect for us, died for us. Jesus was perfect, we weren't, so he could take the penalty we deserve. We, we say those things, but... There's one really key thing we have to be aware of here, and, and a perfect human alone could not do it. And it's in the question. And further, God won't punish any other creature for the sin which man has committed. And further, no mere creature can sustain the burden of God's eternal wrath against sin so as to deliver others from it. They can't sustain the weight of it. If you were in the Trafford Center, we go there again. This is probably the last Trafford Center illustration. And someone comes up who hasn't been done anything wrong. They're, they've not broken anything in the Trafford Center in this whole horrible debacle. And, and they say, I'll pay. And the owner will say, okay, that's this much money. And they'll go, oh, I don't have that much money. Even if I worked for the rest of my life, I wouldn't have that much money. And so the owner goes, well, you can't pay then. It's the same when it comes to, to God and a perfect human being able to pay the debt. A perfect human is not rich enough, not valuable enough, not, not, um, well, not infinite enough, basically. They would, be, they would not be able to sustain and take and pay what is required to redeem and rescue and to satisfy the, the judgment for all of the human race because they're just a creature. Remember, it's an infinite offense against God. So an infinite payment needs to be made. So we're getting to the end. But just to sum up, God is just, infinite and eternal. We've offended him. The offense is infinite. So it deserves eternity if we're going to pay it. We're looking for a way out, but the wrong has to be paid. Wrongs must be righted. We sinners can't pay because we keep on sinning. Creatures, another creature can't pay because that's not fair. A perfect human can't pay because he isn't, can't, isn't, isn't, hasn't, doesn't have the ability to, to, to sustain the, the, the intensity of the, the punishment that's required because they're just a creature. They're not valuable enough, if you like. So you see where we're leading. It's got, it's got to be, a, what, what does that mean it's got to be? It's got to be a human because a creature can't do it. But a perfect human alone won't do. So who is there in the universe that would be, would be both perfect, a perfect human, and, and infinite, and, and valuable enough, and able, strong enough, and able to sustain the, punish, the eternal punishment of God all at once? Do you see the road we're walking, where we're going here? Who is there who's done that? Well, remember that passage I read out at the start, Hebrews, chapter 2. Since therefore, this verse 14, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power over death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. It's not angels he helps. He helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. So he might become a merciful high priest, faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation, to turn the anger away for the sins of the people. Let me read some more things about Jesus. For as by a man came death, 
By a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Jesus is a man. In Jeremiah it says, In those days Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called the Lord. God, the Lord, is our righteousness. It's going to be God that saves. But it's a man that saves. When we're talking about Jesus, we're wondering if he's perfect. He is. They made his grave with the wicked and, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, Isaiah says, and there was no deceit in his mouth. He was sinless. But who else was he? You know that famous quote in Isaiah 9? For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be in his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He's a man. He's perfect but he's also mighty God. Do you see how we've moved our tracks? We've gone from guilt to grace, but we've done it carefully. We're guilty, we deserve eternity. It's a heavy weight to pay. Who can pay it? Not an angel, not a creature, not a person who's a sinner, not a perfect human even, but someone who is gonna be a human and pay the penalty for humans and also be powerful enough to deal with it and sustain it. They have to be God. To take that, you have to be a man to represent us. There is a redeemer, Jesus, God's own son, precious lamb of God, Messiah, holy one. He came, he died, and he saved. But just so we know what that means, it means we can't make for our lives, we can't make sin like it's not important. It's, it's really important. It had to be paid. And you can't pay it back. You can't be good enough to pay it. Someone's got to pay it for you. So it makes us humble. It should make us thankful because God had to come and do it and he had to become a human to do it. That was the only way. He had to step down himself. And it should make us, I guess, it, it should help us see the awesomeness of what he did for us. The weight and the pressure and, the, and the, the heaviness of the judgment he took that only he could have taken when he died on the cross. So that we won't be paying it for eternity. So it humbles us, it gives us thankfulness, and it gives, adds a weight to sin as we see what, it was, what was really required see what we've done. We, we've moved from guilt and we've made the trip to grace. And next week, Henry's going to teach us, look, help us to look more at who Jesus was and, 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 and exactly how he was able to redeem us. But for now, let's be thankful that there is a redeemer who did choose to come, who has made, is making a, has made a way so that judgment can be paid. Let me pray. Lord, thank you so much for, um, for this catechism, for laying out what needs to happen for our salvation. Sorry for taking sin like it doesn't matter. Um, sorry for thinking like that other things could do the job when only you could. But we thank you for revealing this to us and helping us to see it so that we will see Jesus with, I guess, more urgency, the need for him to be human and the need for him to be God. And we'll thank him all the more because of it. Help us to live our lives thankful this week. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I think it's question time. It's question time. Anyone got any questions? The worst thing I can do is say I don't know. Right? So. Yeah, Barney. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Well, I guess um, the same the same book of Hebrews somewhere, uh, and other people will know it better. Will be able to find the know the verse off the top of the head, but it talks about how those those sacrifices were never ever really atoning for sin, but they were a symbol and they were pointing forwards to um, the true sacrifice, if you like, the true Lamb of God, the true ex, you know ex firstborn Lamb, which is what Jesus shows us when he you know he is that's over at the Passover meal and there's only him there there's no he's kind of replacing the lamb if you like so um so yeah good point there were loads of animals but they were i guess people were by by uh, by sacrificing all its animals they were they were they were by faith looking forward to Jesus perhaps without even knowing it or it not really knowing it fully but that, that was it was always about Jesus, he was the only the one, the only, that makes sense, a bit, bit vague, wasn't it, but, yeah. Uh, Alex, you had a question? Yeah, so, uh, if Jesus uh, took upon him all our sins on the cross, yes. and suffered God's, God's righteous judgment, does that mean that Jesus went to hell in our place? Or, I know he previously ascended to the dead, and he turned to the cross, why do we say that? So, um, for the top of my head, uh, I uh, yeah. So there's been difference in church history over whether people say uh, descended descended to hell actually went down to hell um, into the depths of hell, or whether uh, that means merely it, it took what was it, the equivalent of the the entire weight of God on him of of, of eternity, which would be hell forever for us, in one in one intense mm, for for that period of time on the cross either way it's it's the 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 wrath and indignation of god poured out on the sun and torment and all of those things um so there 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 has been disagreement over whether you should say descend to the hell or descend to the dead um on that if that makes sense so did he go i don't think he did i think i think um when he says today you'll be with me in paradise to the guy next to him that's what he means but um uh, you know, I could change my mind if I read some more books, probably. But um, yeah, it doesn't change the substance of what happened in terms of the atonement. If that if that makes sense, yeah. Some have long enough. There's always clear answers. Any other questions? Will was just before Sarah by a fraction of a second. Temporal. So that'd be temporal. Would be like this life. Eternal would be life. So, like, temporal judgment is a bit of an awkward topic because, like, what God would judge us now. Um, but the Bible does say that. And here's a, a big distinction between judgment now and um, uh, Jesus even talks about um, when some bad things happen. I think it's in Luke, one of, somewhere in Luke. Um, and there's even been a, there's a tower's fallen on some people. There's been pilots, the, you know, sacri- there's been a bit of a, an attack. People have died. Jesus, these guys come up to Jesus and Jesus basically says, uh, repent or something worse will happen to you. It seems to be a connection between uh, judgment now and, and judgment in the future. And here's the, the big thing, I think, that we often think um, God isn't judging people now in this world. But if you're, um, that, I don't think the Bible says that's true. It would say that people who are God's, um, are God's people, bad things happen to them and they are being um, that isn't judgment per se, but they're being kind of discipled and sanctified through it for their good. But it doesn't say that about people who aren't Christians. So when bad, thing, bad things happen, they, it's right for them to go, oh gosh, I better repent or something worse will happen to me. They're meant to see the bad stuff now as a sign of judgment. And it could be specific, we don't know, or it could be general, but that's the type of thing. We deserve that because we've rejected God. Can't say we don't. Um, does that help? So. Yeah. Uh, like I'm going to just quote a Bible verse, which I don't even can't remember where it's from. Like us in every way, yet without sin. Um, can you just push a bit harder for me to try and get trying to get what you're after? Yeah. Um, uh, so even, even the body 
So he needs to be fully human and fully God in one person. But what I want to do now, this is, I don't think this is cheating. I'm going to, can we park that? Because Henry is going to go into much more detail about the divine and the human nature next week and what was going on a bit more and why that needed to be. Ex- is that okay? Uh, I don't want to. Yeah, you'll be here. That's to bring you back. That's because I just want you to be here. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, we're done? Come on, Jumpy. You come up. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Tom. We're going to come to the uh, table now to celebrate this picture of what our mediator, Jesus Christ, has done. His body being broken and his blood being poured out. Let's just take a moment just to pause and pray silently and reflect before we eat and drink together. Let's just take, let's just take a moment. Father God, we thank you for Jesus, thank you that he is our mediator, that he stood in the gap between us and you, and took the flat for our sin, the punishment we deserve, that we might be forgiven and be righteous in your sight. Uh, We thank you that we can stand as righteous sinners now and celebrate and proclaim what Jesus has done for us. Help us to do that now as we eat and drink together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 about the Lord's Supper. He says this I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night of his betrayal took bread. When he gave it thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant that's in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again.